I'm Melanie Manos and I am an interdisciplinary artist. So that work out there is my work. Um, so meaning I work across disciplines. I tend to work from the subject, but the classes I teach are focused in um, what we call 4D, so video, audio, a little bit of animation, some live performance. And then I also teach sometimes 2D. I don't teach 3D, sort of my weak spot. <laughs> but, um, and so my practice sort of um, bridges between those two areas and then kind of thinking conceptually, but I also teach an engagement course. So I'm really interested in community engagement. Mm -hmm. I would say that for me, it didn't stem so much of being in um, necessarily a community place like this, but um, kind of on my own as an artist in Los Angeles, the community of artists and musicians, and it was my, it was my family, it was yeah. my life force, and um, I just realized how meaningful that was to me. And so that's how I think I got connected to it. And it's also that at the time it was, we weren't even saying alternative. I think we were saying sort of subcultural, not as many things were like um, in, as established as they are now, or there's more crossover, I think you could say, you know, even like with graffiti art, let's say in that. And, and then it was like, we needed a place for ourselves. Yeah, and I, I just feel that in, in, and I just love like what goes on here when I came to visit. Because I came last summer and I stayed with Linda and I'm staying with Linda now. Thank you, Linda Sandow. Um, yeah, I know it's awesome. And um, just learned about the space and I just saw how alive and how, um, um, what it does for the community and what, you know, and intergenerationally too, yeah. So, um, um, I'm actually not sure if I'm connected here. Let me do that. Oh, so I've been there. Yeah, right. You asked for more. Um, I, so I went to, my undergraduate was at UCLA. I'm originally from Detroit, Gross Point area. Parents are Detroiters and grandparents, I don't know if you want to go that far back, but immigrants from Macedonia and Greece. So, um, um, I left and went to UCLA because uh, I was cold. <laughs> <laughs> and then after years there and, and having an art, graduating and having an art practice, I came back because I was dehydrated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, so let's see if this will connect. I'm not sure if this is on. I think it does take a second to turn that on. This is so cool. Um, so I came back to the Detroit area because I kind of lost my, our community sort of dispersed in Los Angeles. And I found, I came to the Detroit area in like 20, 22, 2002. And it was before a lot of artists were moving in, but it was still that kind of raw. And I'm like, I could live here. And just people were really welcoming. And it what did feel like, even though it's still a city, it felt like going from a big pond to a smaller pond, which was nice. And then I ended up deciding time to get a graduate degree, and I went to I went to U of M. And part of the reason I did that is because um, of their digital media center. Yeah, they've got an amazing video studio, and oh, there we go. It's it's pretty bright, isn't it? The color is very saturated. Um, and so then I graduated and I started teaching there. So I've been teaching there since 2015. And is that right? No, since, tw tw God, crazy, 2009 I've been teaching there. <laughs> yeah, and I just got a promotion, so yay, and do some self-advocacy. Um, and yeah. Um, so part of the reason this project, um, 
is a sort of, I would say, adjacent to my usual art practice in that this, I see this as a bigger than me project because I feel that visualizing women's work is something if I'm thinking right now, let's say in terms of the US, it's something that is, um, has representation all over the country, but it's not something that I feel, one thing I've learned from community engagement is to not to just drop into areas and say, here, here's what I have to tell you. Now I'm coming here and telling you this, I'm actually partly here um, to um, create community and, 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 and see if there's interest in this or just in, in yourselves, in the, in the idea of it. Um, so, um, I've been finding ways to bring in my visual practice with it, but for a number of years, it's just been, it's been a lot of research, mm -hmm. and um, on my own, and also then through with different students. So some undergraduate students, and now I have a couple of graduate students, um, and. And now we're moving more into some digital media. And so I'm going to take you through that. Um, I thought that, so this was one of the, so part of the pro progression was if we create this project. Basically, I was thinking about the historical public visual record, sort of the visual historical landscape and saying like, this is, I always see these kind of um, single heroic military, militaristic um, symbols of heroism, right? So it's like a narrow definition of heroism. And, and you know, after a while you're like, where are the women? And, um, right, and, and you see wife of, or um, it, when I was walking around, I was in, um, the Boston area, and then I was in Salem, and you see a lot of like widow of, and, and you know, but not the identity, or not really what they were doing. What I started to think was, maybe I need to look at women's contributions, thinking about in the sense of what is women's work? So it can seem as a derogatory, but it's also just saying like, how, women are never sitting around. <laughs> right? Whether they're being paid or not, right? And so they've been contributing. It's just not in the visual record. Um, so the reason I put the spinning wheels here is because if I looked at um, the era of this monument, it was Revolutionary War, and I did some research first on colonial women. And one of the things we found was that Women were following the troops, um, making soaps in, to try to reduce the bacterial infections that soldiers were dying of, and spinning wool. Um, there's record that women were also making some undergarments, woolen undergarments, so that men wouldn't die of hypothermia. And this all seems important to me, <laughs> like it's part of the war effort, but you don't hear about it. And they were also spinning to reduce the dependency on the monarchy that they were trying to separate from. One problem I have with trying to do the project this way, I like the idea of going off of the era of the existing monument, but the one problem is how then could I do it intersectionally, meaning am I only showing the white colonial women? You know, and I'm not, I don't want to feel like I'm perpetuating war or colonialism, but filling out the, the record, the history. So that's something I've become more conscious of. Um, so with apologies to you for the audio, I just thought I would show you, this is a video I made, and I know I'm here in person, but it's about three minutes, and it takes you through the, the thinking of the project. And I just thought, I'll play it, because otherwise I'll over-explain it. <laughs> and I'd rather we get to what we're doing now. So I thought I would play the video. And just as a background, this video I made for what was called a feminist teach-out at U of M that they did remotely during the pandemic. And it was was great about it was that there was a, a high school group from the Detroit area of, of girls 
that were working with high school girls that were working with a project, a, some, a supervisor there, but that was connected with U of M. And they were learning about feminism, and then they were guests for this teach out. And it was just, and they had questions, they even had like life questions, like how do you, how do you do some of what you're talking about or, or in, in feel like you can be a feminist if you're in a, a family that still is very patriarchal? And it's, it, they're, you know, the gender roles are very still, you know, and um, so we're kind of getting questions like that. And I was like, wow, yeah, you just, you know, keep talking with your group. Like, keep connected like this. Keep connected with other people you can talk to because it may be hard for you in your family, you know? Um, so I just want to give you a little background for this is where we I'm start. working on a project. Oh, okay, so I don't have this. Do you know if we can connect this to the audio? Let me just... Oh, really? But should I do it to an external speaker? Yeah, so let me just try that. Uh, sound should be all right. Uh, output, we'll do that. Yep, that's the one. Now we'll see. Oh, and I'm going to show you this a little later. <laughs> all right, where are we? That's the only thing with this. Where's this guy? Let me go back. So many tabs open. Okay. Let's try this. I'm working on a project called visualizing women's work, which addresses the gender disparity in public monuments. If you look at the number of monuments, for example, in three cities. So that's just a, uh, just three cities looking at uh, figurative monuments. Um, there's an organization that I'm a fellow with right now called Monument Lab, and they've done a national audit. And anybody can look that up, Monument Lab. So now um, our little three city one, we can just go to the Monument Lab audit. Um, they got a huge amount of money to do that. So that's great. But this was what we found with uh, my student here, Jocelyn Berry. Okay. What were the contributions of women? And how can those be commemorated? Certainly there are statues of notable women, but they're few and far between. More often, a female figure is a goddess. I mean, I'm a goddess. You're a goddess, but <laughs> I'm a person. I'm a person goddess, not like a mythological, allegorical one, representing, you know, like justice. The project also looks at the very form of most monuments themselves. So a hierarchical, authoritarian, shall we say, patriarchal style of monument. Can we rethink that very definition of what a commemorative monument can be? And also, in doing so, redefine the heroic. To give a little um, irreverence and um, add a little humor, I, so one doesn't, you know, like implode with fury. Um, I'm afraid of monuments bingo, thinking that we can have some tours. Participants come and take the tour, or they self-tour, and look around their area, their town, their city, and say, what are the monuments? Okay, on my bingo card, I've got a horse. Yep, got that, man. Cloak. Uh, plinth and a wait, I got it. Weapon! Bing pound! Alright, you win. So, we are looking at how do we redefine that. We must ask how women from all segments of society were working and contributing to the growth of this nation. More often in unrecognized support system roles, both paid and unpaid. This means going beyond nominating singular women in leadership roles, though we like them too. How do we make the invisible visible 
and elevate the everyday. One way is an interactive website that will invite community participation and collective research to populate the map. Another strategy is utilizing augmented reality via smartphones to convey images and information. A third way is through live activist events, such as a spin-in. It's a big job. We're going to do it. <laughs> she says optimistically. OK. <laughs> In our lifetime. Yes, please. OK, so I'm taking you over to um, my website that has a um, little bit about what we're talking about right now. That one thing you saw where it was this kind of image um, it looked kind of transparent, and you could see um, the, the building behind it. That was something you would see through a device called a HoloLens, which is for um, augmented reality. So there's virtual reality, which is put you in a whole other world, like kind of more of a, it tends to kind of look animated, right? But the augmented reality is, have you heard of Pokemon Go? right? Or if you've had a QR code, and then it pops up to something else, right? And then they even have it now, like at Home Depot, you can see what a color can look on your wall, okay? So my thought, when I put on a, I got to test a HoloLens at school, and I'm like, I was having trouble. How do I show what's historical erasure, what's not there? And I saw this, it looked like the, um, it made me think of Star Wars, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Right, and because it was kind of like a hologram, they're called volumetric images, and I like hologram better, but volumetric. And um, I thought that's brilliant because you can see what's there, the choice that was made, like in this image. The choice was made to honor General Thaddeus Kosciuszko, and that he was a Polish professional soldier that came from Poland to fight in the Revolutionary War, went back to Poland. So he didn't even stay here, but there's a large Polish community in the Detroit area, and they wanted a Kosciuszko monument. So the idea is, on the right, if we, we could, you could be standing by a monument and see it, and then also on your phone, see what, is, what hasn't been chosen to be, and give you some history of some women. So this is one of the women that was, there were actually records of women jumping into the battlefield also, so this was Mary McCauley, um, one of the names that did go down in history. So um, that's if you were wearing a HoloLens. So my thinking as an artist is community is that's a one person at a time device and they're at least $3,000 each. It's gonna be a while before I can get that much funding. <laughs> and so, what can't we do something with phones? And did some research on how equitable are phones. So it looks now with like, I saw a Pew Research um, a graph that said, even into lower income families, uh, most people have um, smartphones. And so we can feel pretty good that a lot of people will be able to access this, which is part of the goal. So on the left is then more, a more current idea, which is being able to use your phone, and that's called Web AR. It's trickier than I thought it would be. <laughs> so um, luckily, being, oh yeah, here's some of the other, and just as I'm talking about this, I'll say in the meantime, with some students, we developed a visual language for the project, which is, I said, let's look up some fonts from old newspapers. Um, so we can keep a historic feel, but also then have this newer, like with the uh, augmented reality. So m kind of bridging the contemporary and the historic. And, um, and my student at the time, I tried to kind of go with where they're doing, and he was into this printer called a risograph, and it does sort of a pointillist kind of print. And a lot of times they work with gradient, so we decided to go with the, the gradient. And then we did the monogram, and I have some monogram stickers, by the way, that I'll hand out later. But we're thinking like the sweaters. I mean, I grew up in like a preppy town, so yeah. 
the sweaters all had the monograms. I just hit the mics. Sorry about that, Katie. <laughs> um, all right, so back to a little bit of research I did here. Um, and and the, the, here being, this one's the west side of the state. So in Vicksburg, there is, there is a paper mill, a former paper mill there. And I did some reading about women's labor in paper mills, which is, it was extensive, right? And um, um, I was kind of thrilled to find out there's this former paper mill in Vicksburg. And they have an artist residency there, which I haven't gotten into yet, but hopefully. But the idea is to think about bringing augmented reality to their re-renovating the whole um, paper mill for like community use. And to me, that would be a great place to have um, the augmented reality. Um, here is like an image I found of, it's, it was called the Lee Paper Mill. And I'm just gonna say, I love these hairstyles. <laughs> They're pretty, you know, like specific. What period is this? So, I'm gonna say, I wish that was there. I feel like it was. I do, I think it was early 20th century, yeah. And maybe even, there were some, I think, e further east early, earlier than that. Textile mills and paper mills. Yeah, so here's Ludington. Yeah, and um, a lot of women working were in different um, industries, including watchmaking. The Star Wash Case Company was making the cases, and Karen and Chuck, who are volunteers here, used to live in the condo that's in the site of the former. I still do. I do. Oh, you live there? Fantastic, right? So what do you think? If we could find some place to ha have a QR trigger or a, one of these to trigger information about the women that worked at the... That would be a way to implement this. Okay. Do you know? Um, Right now, you can tell I'm like focusing on women's labor because it's a really good way to get information um, about women that's in records. Yes. My dad was a chief steward for the union there. Oh, fantastic. I, I love this. All kinds of stories about uh, women losing fingers. I mean, one of his jobs right. was to go when somebody... Find the fingers? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, no, but really, and these... Women this is the kind of thing, like, I would just love to get some of these, like, his oral histories yeah. and record some of this so we can just get these things on the record. Yeah, what, another impetus for me is my mother would tell me about her, her mother. And, you know, when immigrants come over, they find a immigrant other Im yeah. from the same area to live with, right? So there's sort of this... Yeah. Okay, yeah, and so in Detroit, this Macedonian enclave, and um, some of my mother's, my grandmother's friends worked in factories, and they all crocheted. Mm -hmm. And she says her, grand, her mother would tell her that friends, or they would all talk about how they would run into the, when they found a new pattern <laughs> that they wanted to learn, they would run to the bathroom <laughs> at the work to try out the new pattern. <laughs> And it's just such a great story and visual. You know, it's like we need to be telling these stories. Yeah. Well, it's also speaking about the community in that factory. Totally, that totally. And, yeah. and a lot of the, like the women, especially mainly looking at 20th century, that's that I've had better access to, but I have had some original, like first primary source documents, like four, we were looking at diaries that we could find from the Revolutionary War era. But, um, hearing about the stories and um, it seems like there's, there's, we're finding a lot through, um, through women that had camaraderie through their workplaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know that there, there's more than that because we don't want to leave out the, all of the domestic-based work and that's, that's still not as recognized, yeah. Traditionally, women were 
right right oh we got i gotta put that on right exactly yeah Right. I'm going to skip ahead to something I wrote that we'll come back to these other ones. It's something I wrote. It's a bit wordy, but this is about like thinking the value we place on women's labor devalued as a result of industrialization. Labor outside the home became available and needed. And so it became more valuable in the rising cash paper economy, right? So this valuation biased domestic labor and today we still not only have the gender wage gap, but much labor by women is still un unpaid or underpaid, mm -hmm. considered women's work. Oh, that's just mom. That's just what mom does, yeah? I know men do things too, extra, but it's still very lopsided. Um, I'm nurse, so. What's that? I'm a nurse, so I've been in that. Awesome, <laughs> yeah. But you know, even that, like finally, you know, letting go of that gender construct. So. Um, I put unpaid, I put paid such as caregiving, unpaid such as caregiving, house cleaning, house management. So one thing I did was, so w one thing I wonder is, can increasing the visibility of women's work historically help raise the consciousness of women's contributions, help support equal pay, respect, and even dare to dream a restructuring of work to support child and family care? After a while, what happens to the economy if Women stop working, paid and unpaid, and if people stop bearing and raising children. I was thinking about how many, the, you know, I guess Linda and I were talking about sometimes it seems like, well, but she wanted to have kids, you know, or it's not always a want, and sometimes it happens, right? And you're like, yeah, mister, but who would buy your products? Who would be taking my class in 20 years if I'm still there? If, if people weren't having children when you ask and raising that them. question, are you asking people to try to answer it? Oh, you can, but I'm sort of, it's no, your, it's sort of a... Your, your problem I, and your issue. It's, it's the question, yeah, like the project. Because I don't know if it will, but it's kind of, that's why I put dare to dream. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I wouldn't know how to answer that right now. I no, know. I know. And I don't know, it, you know, how um, it, it's... A rung in the ladder, I think. A lot of my work, like you see out there, is about climbing. But it's like, I feel, I have to feel like raising the visibility has got to raise the consciousness of women have always been working. And can you recognize this now as work? And I think it's really a pity that the, wow, that the factory closed because. People who were working there did not have to go to war because it became a place that was helping to make women. Right. And I'd like to know what the women were doing. Yeah. I don't Let's find out. Can we team out? Gone, but I mean, there must be some way we could find out at least some answer to that. What did the women do? Right. Or here in Ludington. Exactly. Well, they were. They were working in the. They yeah. Were. So just to add a little bit more irreverence, we were talking about the wage gap. Again, I can't, I have to use humor. And I was working, I was looking at this, um, the Economist Glass Ceiling Index. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry. This is the wage gap by country. So this is Sweden. They're the closest to parity. So they're like at this top. So if, if you look down this line to the left and over, that's the gap. Where are we? And, and we're down here pretty far. Yeah, but all the um, Scandinavian countries are up here. They're closer to one-to-one. -one. That's still not there. But what happened was I printed this. This I was thinking about the gap, because we were talking about the gap, and I was like, how could I visualize the gap, like make an object? I did a 3D print, and it was boring, because the back was just straight, and then there was these things. And I was playing around, and I decided to extrude it and make a cylinder, and I was like, oh, boy, that looks like... It does. So I, then I went to the 3D lab and told the work study kid, hey, so just so you know, these are going to be dildos. <laughs> and <laughs> don't worry about it. He said, I don't think they're eco-friendly. And I'm like, that's a, or bio-friendly. <laughs> that's OK. They're really meant to be sculptures. So 
um, yeah, it's just bringing some, again, it's trying to bring some visibility to it. And we, we were playing with like um, work roles. Like this would be like if you're working at Burger King, like a French fry package. This is in, in medical. Um, this is, we were trying to figure out something, Clam Jam, that when women working as stylists or in clothing. Anyway, this was in a show in Detroit called Women House. A lot of you might be familiar with the original Women House. It was something in the 60s where a group of women, they, they did not feel they had, at Cal Arts, which was still newish at the time, they didn't feel like they had the, the real access to the different shops, like the wood shop, and, and they needed a, a place to be, and so they got a house and they housed the women students there. And they did this, if you've heard of Judy Chicago, maybe, right? So Judy Chicago was part of it. And they um, did some amazing exhibitions in Women's House. So a friend of mine decided there's a woman that was gonna turn her house into an artist residency in Detroit. And they did an exhibition called, calling Women's House Detroit with an X for, um, just to kind of differentiate it and it, it was more, the original women's house was all white women and this was a, a mix. Um, and so we changed that uh, um, spelling. But the 2094 is the amount of time we lost to get to parity. It was a number of years earlier, supposedly that the uh, women were gonna get to parity in the US, white women. But because of the pandemic, it set us back. But you don't know what I can't remember, but I feel like it was like 40 years. It was something like that. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, because so many women left the workforce. Yeah. Um, so let's see, where am I here? I want to go back to a few of these. I love all this um, dialogue, though. I wanted to show you that. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to get funding. So I got, there's something called Night, the Night, Art Challenge, Night Arts Challenge. And I had been doing some research in Detroit to bring this to Detroit. And they gave me some funding to develop the tech. Because I'm trying to figure out how do you work with, um, you've got to get like an online subscription and figure out which place to, which platform to work with. Well, I'll show you in a minute. Luckily, the Center for Academic, so I got some funding from the Knight Foundation and some U of M funding from the Center for Academic Innovation there. So they've given me some people <laughs> to help develop the augmented reality, the web AR. And then I've got some students working in like the law school, looking up what's the record of women's involvement at the U of M law school. What we decided with the Center for Academic Innovation is like, Let's do our test pilot on campus because it's going to be easier to get um, permits and anything more of things we need than in Detroit right now. We'll do a proof of concept and then I can go out. So we're uh, at the same time, the historical library at U of M, the Bennett Library, had, had done this feature on um, early women astronomy um, faculty members um, in the astronomy department in astrophysics. And so I already had these like great um, uh, women sources. So here's, a, here's one. So this is Dr. Lausch, and this was like from the, around 1920, look, looking through a telescope. So I cut these out from these historical images. This was, um, oh, I'm blinking on her name. Forgive me, but I'm blinking on her name right now. But she, oh, Dr. Mosier. So she was a medical doctor in the late 19th century. She got, um, she was a professor and they brought her over to U of M and she'd been teaching at other colleges and under her um, supervision, she said, women need a place. And she developed what was called the women's gym. And then they also, she was also instrumental in, in getting the funding for what became, if you know this on U of M Ann Arbor campus, it's known as the Michigan League. It was built and originally called the Women's League. Yeah. Did she? Yeah, yeah. And so um, it. And so, what I'm thinking is, we'll 
create sort of a walking tour where you can hold your phone up at the Michigan League and say, oh, did you know it was actually the Women's League? It was designed for women. And why was it designed for women? It was because at the time there was this, you know, there weren't as nearly as many women as men on campus. They needed a place, you know, and she recognized that. Um, so this is, um, what's important to me is that um, we don't give up the historic images. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with the computer science side, because it's, when you see like Pokemon Go, um, or if you try some experiments in what's called, let me go out of this for a second, eighth wall, I'll take you to the, which is the, the site we're working with. Let's see if I have it here in one of these tabs, eighth wall. Um, you see all of these kind of images. You see they tend to have sort of a cartoony or avatar kind of feel. And this actually has a recorded person in kind of a volumetric holographic thing. But I don't want to just go right now just to this. Because it's important, one, that we see the existing world but it's also important we don't lose those really great images. So what um, we can do some of this where you see what's called like world tracking where you hold a phone and it recognizes the area and then the images will start popping up. But I said they've got to be these still images right now we might be able to animate them a little bit but I don't want them to suddenly be like a chicken. <laughs> Um, it's just not going to work. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing we can do is um, have an image like uh, in a place. Uh, let's see. So here's an actual thing, right? And then these curved targets would be like come around like an advertising label. It would be an animation that came around it. So we can do some things like that with animations. Um, I can also sort of um, digitize some of these images here. So they could actually kind of like, she could be floating around or, you know, we can have fun with it in an animated way. But so that's what I'm working toward. That's kind of my vision right now, but I'm, you know, sort of just trying to be open to see where it goes and working with the computer science and some of the guests, we can do that. No, we can do this. One idea was um, another one of the astronomers had an asteroid named after her, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> and, and so I thought, well, maybe that could be a time where we could do a, a, a cartoonish animated telescope that you could move, it looks like you're, it's moving toward you, you're looking at it on your phone, right? And you see an image of a telescope in front of this building. And then it sort of pops out and then it can move toward your screen. So it looks like you're looking through into like a portal and you're not actually looking into the universe, but you're looking into a, a make-believe one. But that's kind of an interesting, I think, marrying of the digital, and then you could say, okay, this here's the asteroid named after Mary Dodge Prince. Yeah. Um, so. Would it be accurate if that was the asteroid? It would be accurate. I don't know if we could do it like where it's placed in the sky. Is that what you mean? It would be accurate to the name. So it's named after her, but it actually has its like number name. Yeah. So it could be accurate to that. I think we could do. We could find out. Where is it? Yeah, yeah, where is it? Well, if I told you, you wouldn't know if it was true or not, right? I just, just give her an answer. <laughs> I've been around Andy a little too long. Yeah. I know. I think, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. That, that, that's where, that's, I, I understand. What's that? Yeah. Hi, Sophia. 
I think that that's exactly my dilemma, though. It's like, is that going to be, do we want to just go into that animated world? Or, but I think actually from that circumstance, it's kind of a way we could make use of it because we're not going to be able to, I mean, if we're going to have to simulate it anyway, right? If we show a picture of the sky. There must be a picture of this asteroid somewhere. But that's just like a dot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I, I hear where you're coming from. That's, that's been my dilemma too. So I think I just, you know, here's some images I, I researched. And um, these were just internet re images. A um, couple other things. I, here was a great quote. I thought, I was just like a hired man. She worked alongside men in haying, threshing, and branding, but also did the cooking, washing, and raised from montanawomenshistory.org. Yeah, well, I just love this image. She's out there, he's there. Yeah, so, um, oh, and I've been doing, we've been doing research about Silicon Valley right now, and women were the first computers. They were actually called computers, and you might have seen, they, they were because they, what they were doing was computing on paper, and when men started getting interested in it, they were trying to figure out how to quantify, like how much time it takes, and they started calling it girl hours. Well, in girl out, yeah, I know. And so, and then even more, even more frustrating is then when men started actually realizing, well, we should be doing some of the coding, then the, they, they started making much bigger incomes off of it. So it's, um, there's some great books that I can share where I've gotten some of these, but this is my email, because um, I don't know why I put stand tall, but um, I, I'm, I love these conversations and like hearing from people that are in the area that have the, the knowledge. Um, I'll show you one thing that I did performatively. Um, I was at an artist residency in Crosstown um, at Crosstown Arts, which is in Memphis, and it's in a former Sears depart department store building. Um, it's a huge building, right? And so I quickly I did some research on women's labor in retail and department stores. And the two big areas were clerical and on the retail floor. Um, there were some, Sears was like the first Amazon because they had the catalog, right? Yeah. And what we learned is all the upper floors was all the, the inventory. And we found out one local woman said, oh, my grandmother or mother used to roll, had, bring her roller skates because she would roller skate around to get the inventory, like another amazing image. So um, I had also been working with nylons as, as like a, a, a material, right? Connected to women. Um, women like them, but they're are, because they made legs look good, but it also became an expectation for dress. When I was growing up, like I never w would wear them now. I just, I can't stand the thought of it. But I had to learn how to like, I know. and why are we doing this? And yeah, like, a and there's a runner. Yeah. And then if you go to England, they call them ladders. Did you know they call the runs no, ladders? ladders yeah. yeah, yeah. We did too when we were kids. You did? In Detroit. I didn't yeah. know that. No, I only ever heard run. Yeah. Right. And then you were like, oh my God, is it going to show? And yeah, but then you had that thing in the back. The, the oh, seam, the, the seam. Yeah, the seam had to be straight. straight. The seam had to be straight. Right? So I was thinking about nylons and in the department stores, they were selling them and women were wearing them. So I was just playing around as an artist does and I put them on my head. And I, <laughs> and I was thinking about this idea that you brought up before about the camaraderie of, of the employment and how the women were sort of connected, but also I was thinking about that control top thing. They didn't really have much opportunity for promotion. And so this was a, a um, local participants. Um, got involved, let's see, let's see if we play it.
Um, I asked the participants to choose either clerical or uh, retail. And I asked them to think of uh, one to two sentences uh, as a, a dialogue that they could repeat. So they had a, like a microscript for themselves. And so like she, hers was, hello, yes. Um, she was on the phone. Um, the other ones, may I help you? Uh, it's in that department, that kind of thing. And so they had a simple um, prompt, or they knew what their direction was. Then they could just kind of keep repeating it and, and know what to do. Yeah. Kind of and, like they made an assembly line out of women's work. Yeah. If you're all, you, you have a script. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this is something from their own archives. So, um, so that's about, I think that's about time here. I've been talking for quite a while. So um, thank you for your attention and, and for your interest and questions. Mm -hmm.